Welcome to the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. In this series, we'll bring you 12 of the best talks from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime. This episode is called Austragius, How Greed and Crime Erode Professional Football and We All Look the Other Way. Welcome uh, to this session. My name is uh, Roland uh, Moerland and uh, I have the pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to this session on the book Ostrages that was uh, recently published by uh, Professor Hans Nelen of Maastricht University uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, during this session, which is a, 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 has the style of an, an author meets a, a critic, a critic session, we want to uh, uh, continue the discussion that, uh, that Hans started in his uh, book. And his book was a, a result of an analysis on the, uh, the reflection on crime in, uh, and risks in financial uh, and financial criminal activity taking place in the European professional football in recent decades. And the main goal of the, of the study and the book was to discuss some relevant criminological uh, issues in relation to financing and ownership of professional football clubs, but also the, the transfer of, uh, of players. And we want to continue this uh, discussion during the session today. And for that, we invited uh, Professor uh, uh, Wim uh, Hardijns from, uh, from uh, Ghent uh, University, who also has an interest in sports related crime. Uh, I know he's involved in a project on uh, uh, financial fair play and uh, one of his latest publication actually deals with uh, is an analysis of uh, match fixing, uh, fixing dynamics. So welcome Professor Hardines to this, uh, to this session. Before I give Professor Hardines uh, the floor, I want to uh, go back to Professor Nalen and ask him in briefly 10 minutes, first of all, to explain uh, the interesting title of his book, and then also present us the, 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 the main findings. Uh, and then after that, I will give the floor to uh, Professor Adines to, uh, to reflect on, uh, on, uh, on the book and uh, share his critique and insights with us. And then we can open the floor for further discussion uh, with the audience. So uh, uh, Hans, Professor Nalen, I uh, give the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Roland. <clears throat> Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. Um, indeed, to start with the title of the book, because it's a strange title, I can imagine. You can see, by the way, on the back, um, it's a banner from the Publisher 11 that they used recently at the annual conference of the European Society of Criminology in Malaga, and the publisher said, well, you can have it. So I thought this is a good moment also to show that, especially the visualization, which was made by Onus Schuilenburg. I must give him the credits for that, but it shows already well, the essence, I would say, of the book, because what I would like to stress with this strange title, which is a word I made up myself, is it's related both to the outrageous uh, habits, patterns that I found in professional football that are very crime prone in a number of ways. I will come back to that later on. And the second part, of course, is, is related to the ostrich that you see who puts his head in the ball. Uh, we tend to look the other way, we, and also including we as criminologists. And it's interesting to see, I'll also observe that in Malaga, that slowly, especially the criminological community, starts to pay attention to sports. Uh, we, there was already some interest, especially in relation to match fixing, forms of corruption, FIVA gate, um, in relation to football. And there's a lot to do nowadays in relation also to integrity issues, sexism, racism, you name it. But still, I had a feeling I have a very I have an interest in, in organizational crime, uh, crimes committed by organization, white collar crime, if you want. Um, so financial aspects have always triggered me, have always interested me. And when I had a sabbatical leave for a year, I thought, well, let's combine my interest in organizational crime with my passion for football. I'm, I love watching football. And see, because I for already for a couple of years, I had the feeling, hey, what's, it's strange, especially if we think about uh, financial malpractices. And in particular, I'm, I must stress that, that the focus is on the financing of the clubs. So I'm not looking into corruptions within associations like FIFA or UEFA. And there have been others already that have very written very interesting books on that. Um, 
So my focus was both on the financing of the clubs and also so looking at ownership, looking at investors, and also because as far as, far as I can see, my, my first analysis showed there is a strong linkage with the, the, the role that player agents play. The transfer of players is a tool, is a vehicle, especially in relation to money laundering, serious forms of fraud that can be abused for that kind of purpose. So I thought, let's focus on that. Let's focus on what we know about. It's, I would consider it to be a synthesis to a certain extent I've tried to look at. So it's a very broad analysis based on various documents, all the documents I could lay my hands on, watching documentaries in this field, um, paying attention to all the relevant literature, but also speaking with a limited number of people, I must say. So it's, I've, I've, looking, I've been looking for, for a year into this world to find out, hey, what, are the, what is the essence of the problems that arise in this area in relation to financial, serious financial crimes? And what is our response towards it? That's that's the main goal. Um, so the underlying questions were mostly related to understanding, grasping also the problems, not only trying to explain, but also to understand what was going on. Um, looking at, and that's, that's where the ostrich comes in, also all the processes that somehow prevent us to take it more seriously. It says something about, I would say, the status of professional football and also the collusion between private industry and public and the public sector, which gives all kinds of more or less, um, well, the, the, the power that some people have in this area, also that they can control to some extent how much attention is being paid towards malpractices in the world of football. So I consider the book as a kind of a first step. Eh? So I, I don't think that after you've read the book that you think, well, we've got all the answers. I do, do not pretend that. Also in terms of reactions, I don't think that, and what I wanted to prevent was also to, to focus on specific um, interventions and responses uh, in, in a very detailed way. But I showed some, I would say, avenues, at least some policy options that you could consider. And on, not only looking at it from the outside. So immediately we could start thinking, well, this should be part of the broader AML, the anti-money laundering regime. And that you um, solely look at it from in terms of external pressure. That's what we always are inclined to do immediately. That we think, okay, we have a serious problem. We need better legislation. We need more police powers, more investigations. That is only part of, of the, the things that I would like to discuss. Because as far as I'm concerned, I want also to trigger a debate with the book, not only within academia, session like this one, but also to trigger a debate within the world of football itself and to open up. I refer to walls of silence, um, a concept used by other criminologists in the past in relation to other fields, but I still have strong feelings that many things are still concealed or hidden, um, and we have to break it up. And I come up with, well, different suggestions, avenues, and all those ideas, I think, have to be elaborated at a later stage. So I would consider the book again as a, as a kind of a first step, but nevertheless, I hope at least that it will lead, well, to start with in this session, to some form of debate. And uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm curious to find out what my colleague uh, Wim Hardijns uh, thinks about it after he has read the book. So um, I give the word back to, to Roland. Um, he's the moderator. But I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And then I can address some of the issues that I, I discuss in the book more in detail. But I think overall, this gives you at least an, an idea of what the book is all about what my intention was when I started writing it. And um, again, it's just the first step. We have to do a lot more in this area. And I'm, I'm glad to see that many people are indeed joining, uh, well, the, the community of criminologists who, who look in the issue of sports. I leave it at this, at this point. Roland. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Hans. Indeed, if you say we have walls of silence, then I think starting a debate and speaking up, speaking up is one of the first things that uh, that you can actually uh, do to curb this problem. Um, I will go, now give the floor to uh, to Professor Ardines to uh, to react on uh, Hans's introduction and the findings in uh, in uh, in the book. Wim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, moderator Roland, and thank you very much 
Hans. Um, my name is, is indeed uh, Wim Ardeins. I work for uh, Ghent University as a criminologist. And I work already a couple of years, uh, several years, on the topic of sports and uh, crime. And more specific, everything what has to do with sports, uh, fraud, corruption, and financial uh, malpractices. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks uh, to Hans uh, Nelen for, for including me in this book presentation. I, I very much like to read uh, this book. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and it gave me a lot of, of new uh, ideas um, to, to, to work further on it on my own uh, research uh, projects. So let me start. Um, by saying uh, that the book uh, reads uh, very smoothly. Um, after reading uh, this book, I think you have as a reader a, a very good knowledge about the problems uh, that arise within a professional soccer, professional football, uh, the different cases uh, that have occurred, hence discussed uh, several uh, of these uh, cases, the, the central actors who are playing a, a very prominent uh, role in professional uh, football um, and the preventive and repressive mechanisms that are used uh, today or that can be used uh, in uh, the future. I think uh, the book is very uh, clearly, uh, it's very logically uh, structured. And as a reader, um, you, you are left a little bit curious about each time the next chapters that need to be covered or that follow. And this is an important uh, thing, I think, uh, for, for reading uh, a book like this. Um, so in my further review, I would like to touch on, on some of, of the points uh, raised in each of the uh, six uh, chapters. Um, so I will try to, to pay some specific attention to some interesting, uh, sometimes some surprising uh, results. And I will try uh, to raise some, some question uh, for uh, discussion. So please feel free to add your IDs uh, in the chat or raise your hands so you can take uh, the floor after uh, a couple of uh, discussion points. So, uh, okay, let me start with uh, the first chapter. Um, the first chapter um, includes a, a very interesting uh, discussion of the, the, the growth and the commercialization of uh, professional football. And I think uh, this is very important to bring this, uh, to bring this to the forefront from really the beginning of the book. Um, given that this uh, growth, and sometimes it's, it's like an infinite uh, growth, uh, and commercialization carries a lot of dangers and, and risks. And, and uh, hence, uh, Hans mentions a, a, a lot of these, these dangers and risks in this first uh, chapter. And um, he also gives a, a quite uh, clear uh, picture in his uh, book about um, the fact that professional soccer uh, can be seen as a kind of crime facilitating environment um, and I think um, this is something we can recognize because in the last decades uh, professional soccer has, has, has largely uh, become the playing fields of, of figures of actors with a lot of money on the one hand but also actors persons figures who want to earn a lot of money in a very quick way. And that's another problem I think we need to be uh, aware of. Yeah. So it seems that, that different principles, different rules apply to soccer businesses today than we can see in any other organization or, or business. And the question uh, I want to ask is why this is the case. 
why are there seemingly different mechanisms and processes at play in professional soccer that res results in different financial malpractices being much more prominent in professional soccer than in other sectors? So I think this is a, 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 a very important uh, question we need to ask uh, ourselves. This for the first chapter. Um, with regard to the second chapter, um, there uh, is a discussion uh, on the role of football uh, agents. Um, and there we can see uh, that uh, Hans not uh, immediately painted a very positive picture of these actors in professional soccer. Um, they are ubiquitous and they are intertwined in numerous functions and are involved in numerous financial transactions. In other words, in other words, um, let's say we can see them as a kind of linchpin in the whole uh, story. So by using a number of case studies, this is made uh, very clear in the book and the question arise as to how it has come to this uh, story and how we can change this in the short to medium term the third uh, chapter um the third chapter compares a uh, professional uh, soccer to a kind of semi autonomous social uh, field yeah um, soccer, professional football, has its own structures, its own culture, and it is very difficult to start changing the rules of the game from the outside. And this is made clear in the book. The book discusses the recent evolutions and attempts at change, but it also states very clearly that these are rather insufficient to move towards a clean and financially correct sector. So I think it is important that in this chapter, uh, the role of FIFA, of UEFA is discussed, because here I wonder to what extent sufficient action is being taken by these umbrella organizations today. Is sufficient capacity being freed up to take the irregularities out of soccer out of professional football or is it rather a drop in the bucket fourth chapter um in the fourth chapter the books zooms in on the tools that can be used uh today to address the different problems that are discussed tax fraud money laundering etc and there uh, an essential element uh, comes forward which is the creation of awareness and in my opinion this is indeed a very uh, essential uh, element trying to break a culture of silence and bringing malpractices out into public into the open uh, it is important to stimulate this transparency and I, I can agree with Hans uh, Nalen who says that this in itself will not be enough to lead to major changes in professional soccer but it is a way to keep a finger on the pulse and to ensure that certain actors, certain figures, and certain clubs with wrong intention do not just get a free playing field. However, I think uh, the real uh, changes should come from the actions on the playing field itself. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, the actors from the soccer sector. And on the other hand, the actors who oversee 
the soccer sector. And in the book, you can get an overview on these different actors by a very clear uh, image. This is discussed in detail in chapter five and chapter six. Um, so I think these two last chapters are very important to get an overview of the preventive and repressive measures that are taken or that can be taken in the future. The fifth chapter uh, outlines how the soccer sector itself deals with the issues and how it can improve its own uh, governance, both in terms of ownership and investments and in terms of the transfer system. So various issues are discussed in this chapter, like the distribution of shares, the screening of shareholders, licenses, transfer, transfer clearing houses, uh, football agents, uh, and other uh, likes. So here again, um, I ask myself uh, the question, to what extent is there at this moment sufficient uh, capacity and power from within the sector itself to catch these kinds of malpractices, to tackle them, and to ensure that certain individuals with criminal intentions are definitively excluded from the sector. The book uh, concludes with the sixth uh, chapter, which deals with the external uh, control mechanisms. The criminal justice system, as well as the inspectorates uh, that oversee uh, the industry and the sector. So, all too important uh, cases uh, occasionally come to light and are addressed. For example, in Belgium, we have uh, the famous uh, case Operation Zero uh, during uh, last year's. However, we can assume that most uh, cases remain still under the radar uh, today. So the course of action proposed by Hans Nelen is therefore uh, worth exploring. From a multi-agency approach, we can try to work on supervising sports authorities, which have sufficient manpower and cloud to act. Here we must ask ourselves whether there is sufficient international political will to free up additional resources for this kind of authorities, for this kind of approach. So finally, and to conclude uh, my uh, overview, um, I would like uh, to add, and I agree with the author who states that uh, today the problems have not been researched enough, also scientifically, for example, in criminology. Nevertheless, uh, there are initiatives here and there. For example, in Belgium, we started a large interdisciplinary project on sports fraud, which calls the PROFS uh, project, two years ago. And in that project, uh, criminologists, economists, lawyers, sports scientists, and psychologists are working together to create measuring instruments and tools to reveal trends and patterns in the field of sports fraud. We also try uh, to construct uh, training courses aimed at creating uh, more awareness. So, in my opinion, it would be good if all these kinds of initiatives can be centralized, can be clustered somewhere, so that we don't always have to start from scratch when researching, studying these kinds of problems, and that we can create some awareness 
for practitioners, policy makers who daily work within the sector, around the sector, and who can make use of the evidence that comes forward from this kind of research. So uh, I think uh, this was uh, the, the, the overview I, I want to present today. Uh, thanks for your attention. We raised a couple of questions. So I think uh, I can give the floor back to the moderator of the session who can uh, organize a discussion on these points. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Hardines. Uh, thank you, Wim. Uh, for uh, not only giving us a, a, a very good overview of the structure of the book and the, the, the approaches taken in terms of analysis, but also uh, I don't know, discussing the questions that actually the research uh, raises. And before I think we ask the, the, the public, the viewers to join in uh, with regard to these questions, I want to briefly give uh, Hans the floor because maybe he wants to have an initial first reaction on the, the questions that uh, Professor Ardines uh, raised. Yes, definitely. Thank you, uh, dear colleague, dear Wim, um, because I think uh, you, you've made some very interesting observations. Indeed, I think you have explained to the audience, well, the, the main elements that are in the different chapters of the book. Um, the last thing that you uh, mentioned, I, I absolutely agree with the idea that we should not study this kind of thing in an isolated way but that we should indeed cluster initiatives bring things together and i think when it comes down to maastricht and Gent, well i think the, the re relationships are in, 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 a, in such a way that i think that can be arranged rather easily but i also like the idea because this is also what i advocate we do not only need criminologists in studying this but indeed as you already doing in gent you need other disciplines as well like well you refer to people with an economy background people who are interested in compliance studies in all kinds of organizational studies so i think we need a mixture of people with a different background also to 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 grasp and indeed elaborate on the number of things that I throw up, maybe just to, to address a couple of things because you raised a number of questions and very interesting ones. Um, first of all, when you said in relation to chapter one, the main question that I got out of it um, was, well, if we consider this system as a crime facilitative system, but it's still, it's, it seems to be different, uh, there seems, there seem to be different processes at play in the world of football if we compare it to, let's say, to other industries. Um, so we see similarities, but also we see to a certain extent that this world is rather unique um, and which makes it crime prone. I think that is indeed a good observation because to a certain extent, indeed, I did studies in the past on real estate, uh, on construction and other industries, and you do see indeed uh, similar mechanisms, but what makes the football industry, I would say, unique is not only is it the forms of um, it has created and we allow them to create a world on its own. Uh, it has enormous amount of autonomy. Uh, just to give one example, it's, it's strange. Uh, we have already in Europe have now six directives on, on money laundering, anti-money laundering, and still the world of sports is completely excluded from that which shows something, which shows at some point that we have agreed upon as society, okay, we leave the sector alone, we, we leave it up and we believe in self-regulation. So for a long time, they could get away with that to a certain extent. Um, and sports, let's not forget about that, which also shows why people are very reluctant in trying to intervene, is that, of course, the societal relevance of sports and football in particular, having a a successful football club in your municipality, for instance, it shows that how important that is from, from a societal point of view, which also means, for instance, as we've seen, not only I refer to all the private investors and the investment groups that have entered uh, the world of football, but let's not forget that in a number of cases, also the public sector, municipalities, have actually rescued a number of clubs that were at, well, they also, they they were at a, at a point where they were destined to go down, to go bankrupt. But we've seen many examples in many countries where in the end, 
municipalities, local governments decide, let's support this. So that is intriguing. So the, 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 the um, the, the factors that are at stake, the, the relevant factors may differ to some extent to other uh, sectors where there is at least more. Uh, if you are talking about um, sealing off this community, not intervene, keep a distance, because I, I would say if we look around in Europe and we, we know I, I describe various cases of, of malpractices, and, and but if we look at the number of investigations, by public authorities, they are very limited to a certain extent. So um, Operation Zero you refer to at the end is interesting. I would say it's also an example because what it what it reveals until this point, what we know about it, and we could also, you can see that also watching documentaries on it and reading the material that has been published so far, is that it shows something that forms of fraud are somehow endemic and the role that player agents played, which I refer to in chapter two, is very well, I would say, documented also in the Operation Zero case. We have we have examples in Spain, but in compared, let's say, take my own country, the Netherlands. So far, we haven't seen any investigation yet uh, from outside. Uh, we have we've seen some internal interventions from the National Football Association. They've done something. I will come back to that at a later stage. But in, it, it is striking, I would say, that for a long time, ex as we we left the football sector alone to some extent, and we trusted somehow, well, they will take care of it themselves. And of course, we have done that in the past as well with other industries, the banks for a long time. But we've changed all that. There is more supervision and control in different sectors. But strangely enough, and I think uh, that is the, the, the fascinating thing, that until now, somehow the football sector also due to the high societal relevance, has managed at least to um, somehow to, to keep out of this, uh, the system that we have developed in under, other industries. Um, and that, that is something at least to consider and I, that I want to discuss also in the book. Can we still, uh, we, we all know from the literature and organizational criminology, that it's better to um, come up with uh, supervision and control, not only from the outside, but to come up with forms of, as we call it, responsive regulation, looking also at the industry itself, trying to come up with a mixture, um, maybe in addition to the things you already told in, in relation to the to the uh, responses that I advocate, I came up with this idea. I show, I visualize a, a lineup of a football team in which I show actually that in the end, it's up to, first of all, I would say the football sector itself and the clubs. Uh, suppose you are approached by an investor um, who comes in, who promises you and says, well, I want to I want to invest 15 million or 20 million in your club so you can promote to a higher division. You can play European football, maybe. Strangely enough, until now, the clubs, well, it's not in that respect. You can it's not that strange from the club perspective, because indeed they want to perform better. The fans want that. It shows also a huge indifference amongst the fans because many of them are primarily interested that the club will perform better but still we've seen examples where investors come in when there are so when you look at the background of the money so many questions can be raised or must be raised to a certain extent and many people the clubs the fans everyone seems to look the other way so one of the things in my lineup in the football team, I say, well, the first responsibility to some extent is the ones who love the game, who are primarily interested. But of course, I'm not naive. You cannot expect them to do a lot, but indeed they do have a responsibility as well. Then I would say, of course, the associations, what can they do? Uh, referring also to the question that you raised in, in, in relation to chapter three, when you say FIFA, UEFA, is there already sufficient action being taken? They have done something. I must admit that. So they are not sitting only. I'm, I'm, it's it's not that they have just looked the other way completely. On the other hand, I would say, especially for instance, if you look at the systems that they have come up with, um, what we all know about is financial fair play, uh, which is an interesting system to look at, for instance, when you look at club finances. But the emphasis there is mostly on financial stability. We do not want to say that clubs take irresponsible actions that they that 
so that that their balance is that somehow their budget is completely out of balance. But in terms of financial integrity, if I uh, so far I haven't seen from UEFA and FIFA specific actions being taken that clubs uh, take over of clubs, investments in clubs, uh, foreign investments of groups of investors that come in that you actually also should look at those investments, I would say from an integrity perspective, that you also take into account, okay, are we interested first of all where this money is coming from? I see two main problems in the football sector when it comes down to financing. What my, I would say, first study shows in this respect is that um, there's a lot of uh, money coming in in terms of money laundering, and that's why and so there are illicit money flows entering the sector. And the other main problem is there's a lot of money leaving the sector. And there is just a limited number of, of people, actually. And then I refer to those investment groups, the player agents, um, who are somehow collude. collude. They, they come together. They, they, make, they have mutual agreements. When a new investment group enters the world of football, what you immediately see, there are some player agents involved. And there are start, a, car, a carousel will start. Players are being sold. Players are being bought. We all know from the literature in terms of money laundering and fraud that if you have an asset, and in this case it's a human being, if you can start playing with the value of it, if you can manipulate the value, if you start, eh, we, we've seen that in real estate, we see it in art, but we also see it in transfer of players. We can manipulate it, especially because we do not have accurate data. Indeed, there is a, we can monitor transfers. We can see, we can read in the papers, this player is sold for this amount. But in practice, we know there is a gap between what's being published on paper and what is actually being paid. Those kinds of systems are hugely crime prone. We know that. Uh, so we do not have the accurate data. Uh, FIFA and UEFA so far are primarily interested, I would say, in stability rather than looking at crime aspect, integrity aspect. They haven't really looked into that so far. And one of the problems, of course, you need people who can actually do that. You need people with a specific form of expertise. So you have to know, and we're talking about, of course, in Europe, you have different kinds of jurisdictions. If you look at the financial flows, of course, it, and it goes beyond Europe, because we all know that offshore and all kinds of corporate structures are being used. So the money is being sent around globally. Uh, it's hard. It's difficult. You have to have specific expertise also within the world of football itself. You cannot expect, of course, a club or an association. They do not have the financial expertise available to look into this kind of thing. But I need, I think we need that kind of thing, at least if they want to make progress from within. And there again, you refer to willingness. I would say also, it's not only a question of manpower and expertise, but you must be willing in the first place to look into it. Can I halt you on that, uh, Hans? Yeah. Also looking at the time, uh, but I have a, have a question. What, what strikes me uh, is that, uh, is that both Hans and also Remy says, okay, change should, also, should come from the inside. The players on the field, uh, now they are on set, they need to start moving uh, in a coordinated fashion. But I don't know, looking at organizational crime more broadly, and if you look at other cases of organizational crime, can't you say that we overestimate the ability of these sectors to self-clean, to take control of problems and solve them? Isn't it time? Because when I read Hans's study, I get this feeling, oh my God, things are rampant that uh, enforcement from the outside is strengthened because also you say it's a semi-autonomous field it has showed year over year the resistance to change to not uh what is it uh um, uh, um, buy into the money laundering direct directives etc so can you really rely on uh, on the field itself to change given the experiences that we have now and insights from other uh, fields of organizational crime. So a question for Hans, but maybe also Wim. Shall I start or? Because indeed, I think it's a highly relevant question, of course. Um, 
And indeed, we have to take into account, let's let's face it, it's, we have all kinds of power imbalances. And, and so the general idea that I have, if you look at the book and especially the visualization of this team and that we should all work together, this multi-agency idea, from, on paper, it looks great, but we all know in daily practice, it's not as easy as suggested. And I'm not, not claiming that. So it, it will be extremely difficult. And at least there should be some some interest within the industry itself, because as long as it is only about, I refer that this, this is a form of, well, I refer, because a form of casino capitalism, that you come in with an investment group and you want to make as, uh, you, you will take, you're thinking mostly in short term profits. So you come in, you want to make money and you leave the, the, the industry again. Um, so what in, in such a field changing from which to, 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 uh, create changes within the industry will be extremely difficult. Nevertheless, I would say, huh, um, it's, it's a question of both. And indeed, if, if you have some, so I'm also to a certain extent, I'm hoping for that some people actually, and I've, we've seen already some examples in Belgium where you could say in relation, for instance, to the player agents, huh, that you have people there who say, well, the way, uh, have been dealt with so far, we we think we should be more transparent. So there was this new player agent in Belgium. It's just an example uh, who said, well, I will open up my books. I will show to the outside world everything that I got. It's it, I would say, hey, that's an interesting thing that there is at least a person who wants to say uh, that a new player agent entering the field. Again, maybe a PR stunt or something or that it is. So we have to wait how it actually materializes. But nevertheless, I think what you need in the end is people actually to show to us. That's why I'm also referring to, we have to open up this world. We cannot leave it up to the world itself. So the whole idea about self-regulation, I think we have seen it in other industries indeed as well. You need external pressure. You need severe external pressure. At the same time, some people claim, well, the moment that you add world of football to our anti-money laundering regime. So if we have a seventh or eighth uh, EML new directive in Europe and football is included, that will change the world. I don't think that. Also for a number of reasons, because it's in the end, when you look at our anti-money laundering regime, we have broadened it up over the years. Let's face it, in the end, that's, that's not in, in itself is not the solution either. So it's a combination of things. You have, you need indeed authorities. What, what what I'm advocating for is at least that you have, I refer to in chapter six, not only to anti-money laundering organizations like FIUs, eh, financial intelligence units, the police, the prosecutor, but I'm also saying, well, what we need to a certain extent, we need a kind of supervisory authority in sports in general, maybe. Let's not link it. Let's not limit ourselves to football. But we may need an authority who looks into all kinds of integrity issues within sports. I wouldn't say that is by definition that you should limit yourself only to financial malpractices, but you need an authority with sufficient expertise who has regulatory capacity, who can actually do a number of things. Well, we've seen examples in other industries as well. When you have a strong uh, form of at least a regulatory capacity and authority that actually can do all kinds of investigations that the, that you cannot expect the clubs to do themselves or the associations. We need more pressure in that respect, indeed from, I would say from certain authorities and working together also with scientists like us. If we know that we do not have accurate data, that what we see from there is only tells us part of the story, well, we need and Wim Hardijn just gave an example. We have to work with others. Uh, we have to use other technologies to find out more what's going on in the first place. So I think it's a question of both. But maybe Wim Hardijn wants to add something to that as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Maybe a few things, uh, if I can, can, can be shortly. Uh, I think it's a combination of, of inside and outside uh, willingness. Um, but indeed, like Hans uh, said, pressure is very important. We are in, in a situation that it is very difficult to, to expect changes from the inside only. Um, we, we will have to rely on some pressures 
on some sanction mechanisms, for example, tax uh, advantages that can be adapted. And these uh, can bring uh, changes from the inside. And, and another aspect I want to mention here is what you also mentioned in, in your, your book, Hans, uh, that is the indifference uh, among the fans. I think the fans are a key player today in professional football. Sometimes this is underestimated. And I think uh, that by uh, bringing more awareness among fans, this can also be a pressure mechanism that can uh, have serious consequences for, for clubs who, who, who are not in line with, with, with ethic, with rules, with uh, the financial uh, transaction. So I think we can uh, pay more attention to, to that kind of pressure uh, mechanisms and to break and to hope for bringing uh, changes in, in the future. Thank you, uh, thank you, Wim, for this addition. We, uh, meanwhile, two questions have come up, and I see also a hand that is being raised. I start with the first question, which is from Peter Duncan. Thank you for your question, uh, Peter. And the question is uh, towards Hans: Have you had the opportunity to look into how image rights structures contribute to flows of funds out of the football system? possibly to companies that are not always owned by the players whose rights are ostensibly being commercialized. Did you look into this, Hans? Only, um, well, okay, only I would say, Peter, thank you very much, because indeed it's, that's an intriguing part of the whole system that we, as the audience, we tend to look mostly when it comes down to transfers that we look at, uh, transfer the sums of money involved in there but indeed when it comes down to players and the money especially in relation to tax evasion and the problems that arise there it is probably highly related to image rights structures that are being used so we only see again only part of the story there and that flows of funds and there is indeed some evidence available uh, if you look at um, the serious cases that were found in Spain, this is also one of the things that strikes me. Yeah? If you look at, again, the ostrich or the way that we as an audience respond, many of those cases in Spain, the most famous players around the world, Ronaldo, Messi, Modric, you name them, they have all, all been indicted, all be, um, and some of them convicted or some of them settled their case. But indeed, it was mostly related to image rights. Of those players and the constructions they came up with to avoid to come up with structures to actually commit serious serious tax fraud many many people actually when when messi and his father was uh they were convicted by the spanish authorities uh for these kind of constructions they were revealed interestingly enough i, I think that's also says something about the world that we started thinking about this mostly due to Football leagues, huh? since 2015, there was somebody suddenly who showed to the outside world, first of all, who disseminated the things that he found by means of a consortium of media representatives. And we read a lot about this football leagues, I think, has revealed a lot of information. Um, so there was a whistleblower involved, someone from the inside, who actually started showing to us, to the outside world, hey, this is what the football really looks like. And that is amazing if you just look at part of it, because the, there's still a lot to explore for us if we could get access to that kind of information. Uh, but still, huh, if you look at those situations and if you look at all those Spanish major football players, it was all related to image rights. Um, still, so you can manipulate that really easy. But to answer the question, to be honest, this was one of the, t the things I touched upon, but I would say for more studies, and I know. I think you, you yourself are very much interested in that because I think part of the, the main problem in relation to, especially to tax fraud, is related to the image right, indeed. So I only saw a tip of the iceberg, I would say, but there's far more to explore in that respect. Okay. Thank you, Hans. There is another question by uh, Michiel Vervloet. And his question is, how can you regulate football agents without, without having a European approach? A lot of agents are, for instance, active on the Belgian market, but are not located in Belgium, by which Belgian authorities are not able to make them obliged 
entities, they should become subjected to the MLTF legislation on a European level. Maybe a pan-European solution by the new AML authority. What are your thoughts here, Hans, and maybe also towards WIM? Because I think this is <laughs> a question that not only focuses on what Hans looked at, but I think it's a broader question. Well, and this is also indeed one of the things I address in, in um, I think, chapter five, <clears throat> where, and again, uh, I show some avenues, but indeed this, as Michiel rightly says, is one of the main problems. You could argue, uh, as many people say, we made a mistake in this respect by deregulation, that at some point FIFA actually, and the, the in 2015, decided, well, let's forget about it. So let's deregulate that industry of player agents so um as as a whole that was a message sent around the world i think a wrong message they are reconsidering that but still you have an indeed a problem that if you have if you think about uh, forms of regulations um for instance that people need a permit that they have to deserve a license so you you may think about screening mechanisms that you only uh, but indeed, one of the main questions here is, can you do that on a, on a national basis? Because in Europe, we do that. You can do it in one country, but the moment that somebody actually is located officially somewhere else, then you may have a problem. Indeed, that is one of the things. Uh, you should come up with a European approach, which makes it even more complicated. Uh, but at least if there's some debate in that direction, I would very much in favor of it. Let's face it, by the way, also say, in some countries, like France, for instance, they are far more strict than, for instance, we are here in the Netherlands. So in France, there is already a system which is stricter. But even that, uh, if we come up with new regulations, um, we also have to think about, again, and we know that as criminologists, that people stop, will start coming up with, with forms of, of, let's say, displacement. They start to circumvent the regulations. So we have already seen that some people who are, we do no longer want to be player agents. Officially, they are not very active anymore. Because if you look at the number of people registered, and but hardly doing anything, we do not know whether they use straw men, other people uh, that may represent them and that they are more operating behind the scenes. So this is again we could regulate as much as we can at the same time we have to come up we have to think about the u-turns and the, the the way people might circumvent new regulations but i fully agree that the moment we only look at it from a national perspective it will not really help us because as we know especially when it comes down to transfers it goes through whole europe and beyond yeah. Rim, what what are, what are your thoughts on this yeah, I, I would even say for, for this kind of, of phenomenon, we, we will need an international approach, not only a European one, an international one, because we, we, we see it for a lot of uh, organized, organized crime related uh, phenomena. Um, this kind of, 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 yeah, let's say criminals uh, will always uh, search for, for the gaps in the system. So you need to build that system as proof as possible. And there uh, relies a very important task as this moment to search for these gaps at this moment and to try to tackle uh, these gaps. And this will yeah, ask for, for a very international approach with a lot of stakeholders. This is not an easy task I, I'm aware of, but it will be necessary. But otherwise, you will always see groups who search for gaps everywhere in the world. And, and, and this is, is a main challenge uh, we, we, we will encounter in the coming years in professional uh, football. And you will need to yeah, collect and to uh, bring together most important stakeholders for from most important football countries in the world. Of course, you cannot bring everyone, uh, especially not in the in the international situation we are uh, today. Uh, but a lot of, of of countries can work together on that problem from different uh, continents. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Wim. I had a question, if I may. Yeah, I think if you look at, for instance, books on sports criminology or the book that uh, that that Hans wrote, 
Okay, you don't see it often. I think the, in that way, the book is very unique. It tries to start a discussion. It tries to demystify on earth certain things about powerful actors. There's a lot of money, a lot of power involved. And this made me think uh, at the time when Sutherland published his, his first book on, um, on, on, on white collar crime, it was published without the names of the companies that he was looking into. And, I, and this is a question to Hans, but also to Wim, because he also does research on sports related crime. Can you research freely into this? Or do you also feel, do you also have the idea that you enter a minefield and that you think, oh, I have to be careful? Yeah, so this is not maybe so much a question on the contact, but more the method. How do you tackle such a closed field? And how do you go about? Because I think it's not easy. I think it's got a lot of resemblance with, uh, with the thing when Sutherland starts far, uh, first started to look into white collar crime. Who wants to start? Yeah, I want, I want to start. Um, this is highly relevant, I would say, because indeed we know from the, from the literature and other studies in other fields that it may lead to forms of, and Sutherland um, actually came across that, but I would say many other scholars brave weight when it come, came down to the pharmaceutical industry. And indeed, we've seen it also in the sports industry. Uh, be aware. Uh, and so far, especially when it comes down to those, if you, if you start looking into this area um, and you look, you're starting to describe and using cases, case descriptions, you are, of course, it's, you have to be aware of the fact um, that the things you describe, you want, you are mostly interested in patterns. You're not primarily interested in, in individuals or corporations as such. But of course, you refer to people. And in the end, uh, we've seen examples of, for instance, where uh, people start pushing back organize, powerful organizations and starting civil lawsuits for defamation, for slander. Um, so, so far, especially in the sports industry, we've seen examples, uh, especially in, in relation to journalists, you had the, the late Andrew Jennings. He passed away. He was uh, somehow he was a very critical journalist um, in relation, especially to FIFA, but also the, to the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, who was very, very critical in his document documents in his uh, press releases. Uh, but he was he had to face many, many cases. And so far, I know already from some colleagues also academics, that they had to face civil lawsuits as well because they wrote something, not only in relation, by the way, to financial malpractice in football, but also in relation to, let's say, doping issues. Think about uh, the Lance Armstrong case in doping. Think about uh, Dave Walsh, a journalist who from the start wrote a lot of things about, well, something is not clear in relation to Lance Armstrong. Well, he was not in in many ways. He was excluded. He w didn't have access to the to the writers anymore. So he was, and he had to face he and his his journal what, what he was writing for. They had to face many many civil law cases. And in the end, well, we we know now looking backwards. So it's 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 tough. It's I would say indeed, um, and especially you referring to powerful institutions. Yes. So there's much in terms of. Um, investment groups, large entities, um, who, of course, when, when people write critically about it, when you do this kind of thing, um, you have to be to a certain, of course, it's our obligation as, as, as scholars, as academic scholars, to be prudent and not to write things down just on, based on rumors. So, but in the end, as I also do in the book, I, I look at also public documentation. And in some cases, I've referred to individuals i've given i've given examples um where in some case i had the feeling can i do that or not because in some case especially when i wanted to describe collusion i see various examples of people when i look at in certain competitions when you have player agents the brother of this player agent is the chair of the national football association uh, you see linkages with uefa you see linkages with certain mayors of cities uh, who know who, so it all comes together and it's very much uh, so it's all about they're all part of the same network um, which I'm not claiming in, in some way that they're all involved in criminal activities 
But at least when it comes down, when you look at the, the little strong collusion, small networks, how people may cooperate, there is a serious risk indeed when irregularities occur that mo many others either look away, they don't want to know about it. So you get all kinds of, and the moment you start writing about that, how networks operate, how both the private and the public sector actually come together, are part of the same network. And that it is the moment that you do that and refer to some, come up with examples, it is to a certain extent. It's tricky. I, mm -hmm. I recognize that. Rim, do you, do you, because you do also research on, the, on this topic yeah. uh, or, or related issues, do you, do, you, do you run into the same challenges? Yeah, yeah, of, of course. And another difficulty I want to mention uh, is, is, is data collection and, and data availability, because as, as researchers, uh, we want to rely on, on valid uh, data, on reliable uh, data, but it is very difficult to get this kind of, of, of data. Sometimes we have some data about big cases uh, like uh, the, the, the scandal uh, we had a couple of years uh, ago in Belgium with the, the, the gambling uh, Chinese uh, or now Operation Zero, there will be data uh, available in the coming uh, years. But a lot of other uh, cases um, are rather um, yeah, under research and, and we, 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 we don't possess this kind of, 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 of data. So this is a main uh, challenge we encounter in our research. And in fact, we would need uh, more um, study in the field itself. Uh, and uh, what I want to say with that is that we would need to be uh, as a researcher in the, that closed circuit, in that closed environment that the football sector is. So we need to uh, observe uh, things. We need to have participatory observations to really uh, put your finger on the key processes and mechanisms at play because now, uh, we, we encounter a lot of difficulties when we ask key players to work together with us in a study, in a research. They are very afraid to come out uh, badly, uh, to come out badly when they are involved in a specific club, uh, for example. So it is not easy. Um, so I think where, when, when we can make steps in, in, in a way uh, that uh, we can have a better picture on the, this, these key processes and mechanisms at play, that would be very interesting. So I think this is one of the main challenges, the data collection and the data availability. Well, I, f I fully, if I may, Roland, yeah, 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 yeah. I fully agree with that. Oh, well, to, not fully in a sense that I indeed, I agree with the fact we need better data, absolutely and different ways, both in terms of quantity, uh, quantitative data, and also know about. Um, so I refer to that also in the book, but also more, I would say, qualitative data in terms of observations indeed, and, and people talking to insiders who can tell you a little bit what are the, pri what are the mechanisms at play, um, and w where, it, where it becomes a crime risk, really a form of crime. What, so what, what kind of, how, what do networks consist of? And I've tried to do that. I spoke to a number of people, but they are pretty reluctant. And here again, this is a kind of an ambivalence for, I would say, for an academic. In my virtual lineup, I do not have the academics as part of the team as such, because in the end, they are, in my visualization, also journalists. We have to be critical. We have to keep some distance. We have to analyze things. So that is always finding the good balance, of course, doing this kind of study. Okay, we want to be as close as we can, but at the same time, we want to keep some distance. And that this is also a thing that we recognize in all fields we do. We, we try to conduct studies. But particularly in this area, it's very, very difficult to get access to people who want to talk. I spoke to, indeed, a number of insiders, a football player or two, some coaches, some player agents, but not many because most of them say, oh, wait a second. Um, this is something 
or they wanted to talk in very abstract uh, general terms, which was, I would say, so you have to take time for that. And I know from studies in other fields that the more you invest into that, so I actually believe in it. We know it's difficult, it can be, can be done if you take your time and you have good contacts. At the same time, well, we have to keep some distance to it also to become, well, to review, to reflect on things from more from a distance. So finding that a, a good balance there. What struck me so far, and which is also to a certain extent, I would say a disappointing thing uh, as part of the spin-off of the book, of course, I send it to representatives of the football sector itself. So I've sent it to the KNVB, the Dutch Football Association. I've sent it to UEFA. I've sent it to FIFA. Just the announcement, hey, the book is out. Might be interesting. Let's have a discussion. Let's have let's arrange something. As far as I'm concerned, there's something going on. So it's but so far I haven't received any reaction at all. Um, so that is intriguing, of course. It reflects more or less the ostrich in, uh, that you can see in the back. That. It's still it's a hard to get things going and open up this world and to get in, but nevertheless we should indeed this as a, as I said at the start I consider this as a first one of the first efforts there have been others but not that many so far so indeed Wim as you mentioned also we should work together and do whatever we can push a little bit more from the outside um, we are fascinated by crime we are fascinated by football we bring this together with a number of scholars we work together cooperate and let's hope we can make some progress in this area because there is a, definitely there's a need for doing so and i know that others including some of you are also participating in this session that you are also interested so this is also i would say a message for all of us to to do this as far as we can in a, in a well in a cooperative way thank you uh Hans and thank you, Wim. There was one more question by uh, by Stein Stein Merkus, who says, "Okay, do you have any idea who is behind the money laundering? Like, where does the money come from? Is it illegal drug money? Is it money coming from other uh, uh, kinds of criminal enterprises? What so? What do we know about the origins of this flow of money?" Well, interestingly enough, because we are inclined, at least when it comes down to money laundering, many people at least, they immediately start thinking about drug trafficking and that drugs money must be involved somehow. There is not, not that much evidence involved in the case that I looked into, and I tried to look at to, to look into as many cases as, as I could. Uh, and again, you have to work with limited data, but still, I have the impression when it comes down to money laundering in this respect, it's, it's more about people who are involved in, let's say, uh, forms of, of corporate crime, organizational crime, that have at least come in, investors from uh, from other countries. Uh, in some cases, there have been, we, we've seen convictions. Eh? There are classic cases where you actually see that people have been convicted for serious fraud. Nevertheless, they, are, they, they invest still, they are still investing money uh, in other countries. Um, but it's mostly related to, I would say, fraud, corporate crime rather than, than drugs. There are some examples in, in Middle and South America, whereas more where you see, uh, well, drug, uh, drug networks actually also in, uh, su succeeding in, in, in laundering money in the football industry. But overall, we've seen many investment groups and there is no such a strong link with drugs at, whatsoever. Which I would say also underlines the fact that we sometimes it's too narrow minded to solely talk in terms of money laundering to what's going on in the, in the field of drugs, that we should look beyond that. Because I think and football shows that, that when you talk about different forms of, of dirty money that are being invested in the industry, I think in most cases it's not coming from the drugs world whatsoever. Okay. Like because we are running towards the end of our uh, of our session, Wim, do you briefly want to uh, to react on this, or do you think that you know there is still something that you want to say that we did not address and that you think is uh, important to end on? Well, I, th I think an important one. I think what what Hans said last, I can only agree with that. There is no evidence that, that there is a, a high percentage of, of drug uh, involved uh, drug uh, money laundering. Uh, it's more. It has more to do with, with tax frauds, uh, corporate frauds, 
uh, indeed. Uh, but the last point uh, I, I can conclude with is um, that we as, as, as scientists uh, can uh, think together on, on making uh, tools, uh, making instruments, measurement instruments that can be used in the future by uh, everything who wants to tackle this kind of phenomenon. For example, we can work on broad uh, perception uh, tools. We can work on make uh, trainings for law enforcement agencies who need to investigate these kinds of problems. So I think we can facilitate a lot of actors who work around this problem, and we can do that in a very evidence-based uh, way. And that can be a main advantage for we as scholars. Uh, and that is something we can, we can deliver that is not only scientifically uh, relevant, but also uh, in the field. So I think uh, that can be uh, an interesting key point to take home. Okay, so like based on our scientific knowledge and methods, we can empower those who need to <laughs> work in the field to, to, curb the, to curb the problem. Hans? Well, yeah, my, my final words may be, well, I think, what, what Wim just mentioned would be a good conclusion, I think, of, of a very interesting session. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I regard the book as such as, as a, more as a starting point, and it's something that, fortunately, there are more and more scholars interested in this area. I recently heard about a new uh, institute in Rotterdam working in the world of sports and integrity. So increasingly, you see in the Netherlands, in Belgium, I know in the UK as well, and in other countries, there's more interest in this field. And there's still so much to explore. And not only in the world of football, eh? it's just because I was a football fan, but I see, see other types of sports. So let's uh, continue working yeah. on this. And I hope to see many of you at, in another occasion. That was also a question. Is it only a, a problem in football? Do, or do you also have this in other, uh, in, in other types of sports? But we run out of time, so we need to wrap up. That's something for another discussion, another panel. I want to thank Hans. I want to thank Wim. I want to thank the attendants for this, uh, this interesting session. Uh, hopefully you will uh, move on to other sessions because the conference uh, keeps on going. There is no food for thought uh, to, be, uh, to be gathered. Um, so we uh, we tune out here, but I think, as the speaker said, hopefully on the background we keep uh, 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 collaborating because I think there are interesting avenues to pursue there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. This talk was just one of 85 from this year's 24-hour conference on global organized crime. To get access to the rest, head over to oc24.haysummit.com. Thanks for listening.